podcast is a member of the WWE Universe, or I beg your pardon, the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Hmm. Go to VoicesOfWrestling.com. The rest are tremendous podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and things of that nature. Uh, with respect to the world of entertainment, or wrestling, which is really just what my dad did. Well, in any event. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of WrestleNomics Radio. I'm Brandon Thurston, broadcasting on demand from Buffalo, New York, where today is Sunday, April 25th, 2021. And today on the program, more thoughts and analysis on WWE Q1 2020. They had their earnings report on Thursday. WWE personnel moves in the era of Nick Khan. Week two of the five nights a week of primetime wrestling era. Week two. We will review the viewership. The real WrestleMania attendance for this year, night one and night two, thanks to our friends at the Tampa Sports Authority. And Major League Wrestling has announced a TV deal with Vice. And did New Japan turn down a similar deal? We'll talk about that too. And more. But first. And now we are joined by our friend and correspondent from HQ2, Chris Golo, to join us to review the topics and the news in wrestling business this week. It's been a very, very busy week. Thanks once again for having me here. And uh, whenever you're ready, because it is a been a very busy week, we can get right into it. Yes. Um, All right. What's first? I forget. Well, we're going to get into viewership for the week. Of course, you know, five nights a week of wrestling. But we kind of had a six night this week as we had WWE on AEW programs. And on e, I'm sorry, A&E on Sunday night. Uh uh, first with the Legends biography of Stone Cold Steve Austin, and then WWE's Most Wanted Treasures, uh, where they actually had Mick Foley on. Um, both of those had pretty impressive debuts, uh, Brandon, uh, and honestly, over a million for the Stone Cold biography documentary. Yeah, these uh, these any shows did better than NXT, which I think is the takeaway. But r- real quick, I just uh, got my second shot two days ago. I felt like I was run over by a truck yesterday. Yep. Um, I also had to have juice right after I got the shot because I had not eaten since the morning and I was feeling a little, little lightheaded, but they gave me like three juice boxes and I felt much better. Um, you have done a wrestling show since last we spoke. Have you not? Yes. Yes, I have. I've done two. 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 You, do you want to disclose those locations and what you did? Well, one of them was a more of a seminar, but seminar. Uh, <laughs> yes, seminar. Uh, but uh, yeah, I uh, rang announced twice this uh, weekend. I could say that the Friday night was a show in New Jersey at the world famous Monster Factory mm. uh, for NFW. How long of a drive? Uh, about seven, seven and a half. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, and then the next day was a seminar at the uh, X in Binghamton. Mm. How was that? Uh, that? That was very, very good too. So no spoilers. You can't spoil it. Uh, you can check out their social media and all that, but, but both events were good. I mean, precautions, you know, were taken and masks and social distancing and the handshake thing is still kind of, yeah, there's a lot of people. Like? Is everybody shaking people, each other's hands? Yes. People are reaching out for it. <laughs> and then what do you, did, did you shake hands or, or did you I, like snub everybody? I'm, I'm like doing like, I'm, I'm trying if I can to do fist bumps or the elbow bumps with people. Yeah. Um, if I know somebody is like fully vaccinated like myself and they go for a handshake because I know I'm aware of some people, I'm like, okay, but it's still, it's the awkwardness. Yeah. I have not trained since March, 2020. Uh, I have not done anything in wrestling besides Russell Knox really for about 15 months or so here. So that we'll see. We'll see. I'm going to wait a little while still, but getting closer. Um, we are doing an experiment right now of a live stream on Twitch, totally unadvertised because it's not going to be good. I've already realized that I might have 
been broadcasting an echo of our podcast for the first uh, minute or so of this. I think I have it uh, under control now, but um, I'm just ex- experimenting with, uh, you know, I had a great idea, which I shared, I hinted at on Twitter that maybe, you know, you think about where the value is. I've been listening to Nick Khan, his podcast, I mean, earns conference call this week. The value is in live. That's what WWE has. And we can have live too. You think about what are the two types of programming that are performing really well still on linear TV? It's live sports and there's something else isn't there. Do you know what it is, Chris Gallo? Is it reality programming? Some reality programming does well, and it's and it yes. and that programming tends to be cheap too. I think so. That's sort of cost effective. Uh, news, right? News programs. News. Yeah. And and two people right now watching on Twitch, our experiment here, are watching the slow crawl of various wrestling parent companies on the lower third. Um, so if Rupert Murdoch is watching, if he's one of the two people here, he can DM me. DMs are open. But anyway, you wanted to talk about TV ratings, I guess. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we want, I want to start. We'll, we'll start with Sunday night. Last Sunday was the debut of two programs on A&E that were uh, done by WWE. One was WWE Legends Biography Stone Cold, and the other was WWE Most Wanted Treasures. Uh, and this one had Mick Foley where they were trying to find items from him and all that. A really impressive rating uh, for really both. But the um, documentary did uh, over a million viewers, uh, one point. 062 million viewers uh and it did about a 0.38 in the 18 to 49 demographic very impressive for a documentary which really i haven't watched yet but i imagine it's kind of rehashing of other stone cold documentaries um i don't know if there's a lot of new info to learn uh and then uh, most wanted treasures uh did about uh, 766,000 viewers uh, with a 0.29 rating in the uh, key demo. Where are you, where are you so, getting the uh, information from? You have these numbers at your fingertips, Chris Cole. Well, the, 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 the great people who run the WrestleNomics Patreon. So, Are, are you in the WrestleNomics viewership spreadsheet? Is that where you're at? Um, I'm, I'm actually not right now, but I'm actually reading articles where I know they took it from you and they put it in there. So, I mean, they have some show buzz, show buzz daily stuff too, but are you on the tor- are the torrent sites torrenting, <laughs> torrenting. Uh, Islamics viewership spreadsheet? Yeah. Anyway, um, the big thing that sticks out to me is that, uh, I don't know whether total audience matters more or P, P 18 to 49 here, but, um, NXT, uh, this, most recent Tuesday, their second Tuesday alone here, 0.23 in, in the 18 to 49 demographic. And uh, that was lower than th- three other, let's see, uh, lower than Miz and Mrs. in that 18 to 49, which is a 0.24, uh, much lower than the Stone Cold biography, which Nick Khan called the most watched biography on A&E in 16 years, is what he said on the earnings call on Thursday. Uh, WWE Most Wanted Treasures. 0.29, also higher in the 18 to 49 demographic than NXT. Uh, so we have three programs there. And uh, even Andre the Giant, which had a number of airings, uh, 0.17 on Saturday at 10, which was the, the most viewed one. And that was just the HBO documentary that I think A&E bought the rights for. Is that what it was? Okay. Yeah. Because I, I, uh, I went to A&E streaming site last week and i saw oh they they already did one on andre the giant before stone cold and i'm and it's and i'm like oh this is the same hbo one so that's what we know we also had dark side uh of the ring confidential that did a very small audience i don't know if that was a replay or not because my uh my sling dvr did not record it which makes me think it was a repeat but i'm not sure um we have a number for smackdown overnight number for smackdown smackdown always gets a uh, get snubbed here on Russell House because we record on the weekend and we don't get the final SmackDown number until Monday afternoon. <clears throat> but uh, SmackDown appears to have done a better than usual, slightly better than usual, 1849 viewership. But uh, the most recent SmackDown that we have data for, which was last week, Friday, the 16th, 2.1 million viewers high on the, on the range for them. Uh, lower though in the, in the demo with a 0.56 uh, demo rating. So, SmackDown kind of a middling number, but a, but a fine number. Uh, and AEW, well, let's talk about Raw first since that was Monday. And then Raw did a, uh, let's see here, 
I've realized I've, I've only collected one hour of raw when raw is in fact three hours and reported as three hours. So I will go to the WrestleNomics viewership spreadsheet, which you can get access to at patreon.com slash WrestleNomics for just $5 a month, among other things, including WrestleMania reports and things of that nature. Uh, raw this week uh, on Monday, 1.9 million viewers, pretty strong in the first two hours, but was drained down to about 1.7 million viewers in the third hour, which is kind of the usual pattern. Third hour is usually the least viewed, but swept cable in the 18 to 49 demographic as it has a number of times uh, in this first quarter of the year so far. Um, a 0.61 in the demo on average across three, the three hours. So a, a decent number. Um, Raw did a really strong number the week before, which was the post WrestleMania episode. But they really um, held up here uh, more than maybe people thought they would coming out of out of WrestleMania. We'll see what happens, though, going forward. The the spring and going into the summer and then the fall is usually a time of sequential decline in WWE viewership. Um, meanwhile, AEW did a 0.11 million viewer audience. Uh the third, I believe it is the third most viewed episode in the history of Dynamite behind last week and the debut episode in March 2019. Number two uh, on the chart, which is ranked, Showbuzz always ranks these by P18 to 49. Uh, so behind challenge still, we, there should be like a, a Patreon somewhere, not my podcast, but so there should be a Patreon somewhere that just reviews these other programs uh, like Below Deck and uh challenge and uh i guarantee there's a real world road rules challenge podcast out there i would imagine <laughs> those people are passionate about it as you can see 0.37 in the demo though i uh, i i dm'd someone in AEW after uh reading this this number and i said another another million we got another million uh, viewers for the show and this person responded yeah <laughs> so i my, my read is that you know We've heard it many times that AEW and Turner, AEW because Turner values 1849 demographic far more than they do value the the total audience. And the, and the, and the 1849 demo was 0. 0.37. So what was it in recent weeks? Last week, it was, because so I have it here in the notes. And actually, if you're listening right now, and if you're a patron, you can go to the, the notebook and you'll, you'll see this, this table that I have that's showing the last uh, two weeks of, of viewership here. Uh, last week was a 0.44 in the demos. This was down substantially uh, from last week. Uh, do you think it was a, it, it was down a little bit. I wonder if the Tyson factor was what got that little extra, basically close to a hundred thousand uh, uh, viewers that kind of dropped. I mean, I, is it the Tyson factor or just like, Oh, this is cool. It's those NXT audience. And maybe some of them just like, oh, okay. I'm looking at the demos uh, from, from the two weeks. A lot of the P 50 plus is still there. They did a 0.50 on the 14th and this week they did a 0.48. So m- most of those P 50 plus viewers stuck around and, and that kind of tells you that this is, these are only two data points. We'll see what happens next week or this coming week. Uh, but it looks like they've got that large P 50 plus audience that they had been seeding apparently to NXT for the last year and a half. Um, that, that's really going to boost their total number, which they don't care about, but it'll boost it. Uh, but it looks like, you know, who, who did they lose? They lost the uh, younger viewers. Apparently. We go from a, uh, let's see, an 18 to 34, the younger half of the 18 to 49 demo, they went from a 0.26 to a 0.17. Um, I have the Nielsen universes. You can do the math on, on what that is, but I don't have it at my fingertips right now. But that's, uh, that's I don't know, probably about a, a, a 33% loss in, in 18 to 34. But um, that, compare that to what Raw did in that same demo. Raw doubled that with 0.38. Uh, and then impact uh, this past week, um, as like last week, you know, uh, there was a drop. But this past week here, uh, it was actually the lead up to the Rebellion pay per view drew uh, one hundred and forty five thousand uh, viewers with a uh, zero point uh, zero five rating in the uh, eighteen to forty nine uh, demo, uh, ranked one hundred thirteen on the cable top one fifty in that key demo, and one hundred thirty two for that night in viewership. Yeah, so. The WrestleNomics meter says that this is an above average number. Uh, we're getting to the uh, the pay per view, which is happening tonight, right? It's Kenny Omega and uh, Rich Swan yes. is tonight. So we'll see what happens. I would expect Kenny Omega to win the title and to appear on Impact regularly going forward, and that should mean an increase in viewers. Whether or not it, it does, I'm, I will have people in my mentions now. I, it occurs to me uh, on Friday afternoon when the Impact ring comes out, declaring or 
uh, undeclaring Kenny Omega a draw. So we'll see. And we, they may or may not have some competition on Thursday night, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. You think um, so? Go ahead. Uh, well, all right. So anything else you want to talk about viewership? The, uh, the comparisons for last year that I track, um, are impact. I think had a really, really low rated, especially in 1849, a really low April, 2020, which is early on in the pandemic. Um, they had in-ring programming throughout. They never missed and they never aired any, any best of episodes or anything like that, but they had a really low April, 2020. Um, so they are up more than a hundred percent by my estimation. Uh, we have, we have, I have viewer counts for 2020 for the whole year. Shoba has only started to report the demo rating and, and the viewership since December. But I, 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 you know, if my math is anywhere near correct, they're up tremendously uh, year over year. But then again, that's comparing April 2020, which is a very low performance for them. Um, but nonetheless, even if you compared that to some of the better months of 2020 for AEW, uh, they're still doing pretty well in a year over year comparison. Um, and of course, AEW and NXT are, are looking strong in that sort of comparison too. But, you know, you got to consider that now we're looking at a month where they're unopposed rather than competing head to head. So viewership really though across the board is, is doing well after this narrative for, you could say for a number of years that wrestling viewership was really suffering. And I th- I, I've d- only now in, in the last six or eight months, I feel like I have all the data that I need to read what the viewership really means in terms of the popularity of the associated products. And I think, I mean, this is something to, to write an article about or something, but I think 2018 was a really hard time or a real time of significant decline in viewership in 2019 maybe is, is the better year to, to point to where you have sort of uh patterns where on when you look at the months and compare that month to the same month of the prior year where you have big declines that are in excess of the decline of top 50 non-use cable which i think is a good control to compare it to but right now wrestling viewership seems to be doing all right and uh despite uh fiend lore and Alexa Bliss's uh, uh, doll or whatever, this is drawing the masses in, or at least not chasing them away. They're doing all right. And, and uh, Raw has done better than I expected in Q1 and has continued to hold on to that audience in the first couple weeks of Q2 here. All right. So we will uh, move on. Speaking of uh, television on wrestling, there was a deal announced this week. MLW, Corp Hours MLW Major League Wrestling has signed a deal with Vice tv um some factors on the deal is is that it's not exclusive uh they can still be on dazzin they could still be nbn sports and as well as what's that streaming service called i i call it dazzin is it not pronounced that would you so what's the spelling tell everybody what the spelling is (laughs) d-a-z-n the zone the zone is how you pronounce that brand the zone yeah obviously yeah well, <laughs> they're on DAZN, uh, as well as Beyond Sports, and they will continue to be on that. Uh, and then there wasn't any date announced and just came out uh, the last couple of days. Corp Bauer said, gave it away May 1st, but he said it's going to be some best of 2020 stuff. So maybe they're just doing the Saturday introductory programs, and then it will eventually move to the rumor is Thursdays. It would be almost like. Uh, you the know, idea is that it would it would uh, either lead in or lead out on dark side, right? On dark side of the ring, yes. That's that's the idea there. Uh, I am a little surprised it was big as Vice, to be honest with you. And this count now, I mean, Vice has a bigger reach than Access. So your thoughts on us? Yeah. Do, do we know how many homes Vice is in? Someone in the chat is asking. Uh, you think it's more than a- than access though, which is about half the cable homes. So there's about 80 million cable homes. Um, TNT and USA are in just about all of them. Um, Vice, you're, you you can try to look it up. Um, maybe they're going to do a weekend slot, which is where they've put this on Saturday at noon, airing old content on May 1st. I don't know what's airing in the in the Thursday slot either before or after whatever the slot is going to be for Dark Side. But um, why would they not put the old content there to start to build in that audience. I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up on Saturday at noon. There are also reports coming from PW Insider that New Japan turned down a deal with Vice. Have you heard about this? 
Um, I have heard real quick though. I do have uh, info on that. Uh, Vice is in over sixty million homes. Sixty million. How many is Access in? Um, I'm still trying to find that information. So, I I believe it's less than sixty though. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, but anyway, so this is my understanding: is that New Japan was offered a deal with Vice. My understanding is that New Japan did not pick Roku over Vice, but rather Roku is like a place to sell their content. Uh, sort of a video library rights sale. And uh, the deal that New Japan was offered by Vice, uh, New Japan felt that they could get a better deal elsewhere, which they're still working on. It's not like the Roku and Vice deals would have been mutually exclusive. So that's my understanding of what's happening there. My uh, guess is that Vice offered both New Japan and and MLW something like an eight to 10 week trial and an ad revenue split or some sort of very small guarantee. That's probably good for, for MLW, but New Japan feels that like they can do better. If MLW does well here and delivers, I don't know what Vice would be expecting in terms of viewership, but Vice is a relatively small network. We know that uh, was it the Owen Hart episode is like the most viewed program ever on Vice, which uh, is somewhere in the, in the WrestleNomics uh, viewership spreadsheet to get an idea of what the absolute ceiling is for, uh, for Vice. So it could go well. But uh, yeah, in the spring, sometime we will have six. Jesus, W Raw, SmackDown, NXT, AEW, Impact, and MLW. A sixth, maybe not in prime time, but on a major, major enough cable network. And uh, so access to be just you know fifty million homes, fifty million homes. And you said uh, sixty Vice, for Vice, sixty. 60. But yeah, so uh, it just wrestling keeps getting added on to uh broadcasting schedules you know the tv rights that the, the future is uh is tv rights for live sports or at least you know somewhat live sports <laughs> uh so we're gonna move on to uh it it was a busy day for you uh last thursday brandon it was the WWE quarter one release of all the information as well as the press conference and uh there there's a lot to go over here a lot of meat and potatoes you would say uh, first of all, what are your major takeaways from the Q1 result? Well, uh, I did an immediate podcast that night. So this was Thursday. Earnings call yep. happened uh, at five o'clock. Documents dropped about 30 minutes before that. Uh, at eight o'clock that night, I did a, a an audio and video podcast that you can find on the Patreon um, where uh, I, I talk about what my takeaways were. We'll talk about some, some additional stuff here too, though, as well. I also had a chat with uh, John Pollock from Post Wrestling uh, on Friday, and that is out on their free feed. Um, but one of the big things, I don't know, everybody wants to, to pay attention to Vince first. So let's pay attention to Vince. Vince uh, spoke for about 60 seconds. I've now timed it. It's about 63 seconds. And that's all he said. That is the, the only time that he spoke on this earnings call. Um, I have to be pedantic though, Chris. It's a earnings conference call. I don't know that I would call it a press conference. I used yeah, it's to, earnings conference call. In Sorry. My, in my early days of listening to this, I used to get discontented listening to the analysts uh, not ask the pressing questions like, what about releases? You released a bunch of talent. Um, <laughs> what about the wellness policy? But these, you know, why, why are they so interested in how much money they're going to make? Because these are stock analysts who, whose main purpose is uh understanding the company estimating their financials going forward and uh identifying growth areas so i always see uh people on on twitter calling them callers or something and uh you know so let's listen to vince's comments at the very beginning of uh of the earnings conference call thanks thanks for joining us everybody like every other uh former entertainment or sport we're coming out of COVID. At first, we were in survival mode, but uh, we found a way. Once we felt secure, we then saw this as an opportunity to rethink the way we do business and open what I call the WWE treasure chest. The only way you can do that is have the best management team in WWE history. We have that team, a team that's innovative, in the drives revenue and has reorganized our company in a far more efficient way to take advantage of new revenue streams, new online platforms, new consumer products, new content creation, and new opportunities to expand our media rights 
portfolio on a global basis. Um, I'm always excited about our business. I don't think I've ever been as excited as I am now. And that's it. Uh, Laura Martin, who's an analyst from Needham, she, on most of these calls, while other people are taking questions, she will say, actually, I have a question for Vince. She was on this call. She asked a question, but she did not call out Vince this week or this quarter. Um, so that's all that Vince had to say, talking about the WWE treasure chest. <laughs> um, but major takeaways from this, uh, we need to talk about the financials that yes. is more profitable than analysts expected by about 2x. Uh, the EPS that the average analyst estimated was about 22 cents. They reported, I think it's 50 or 51 cents. So an EPS is like, it, it means earnings per share. And it's basically you take the net income, which is the profit after everything, after all the taxes, it's the most final form of profit that there is. You take the net income for the quarter and you divide it by all of the shares, which is in this case, diluted shares, which I don't understand what the difference is between diluted and basic shares. But there's about 85 million diluted shares. You divide WB's net income for the quarter by the, the number of diluted shares. And you get for this quarter, 50 cents. Analysts estimated that it would be 22 cents. So it'll be much more profitable in this quarter than analysts who are financial experts who cover WB in addition to a number of other companies. Uh, much more profitable than they expected, mainly because uh, it was underestimated just how much money WB would get from from NBC Universal in the first quarter containing Peacock money. Uh, Christina Salen, who's the chief financial officer for WB and has been now since August, she did on the last uh, earnings call give the indication that W would be getting a lot of upfront payments uh, from Peacock because of the transfer of subscribers and intellectual property, whatever that means. Um, I would speculate that W probably anticipated some sort of gap here in, in revenue because there would be this time where U.S. subscribers know that W Network is coming to an end soon as a direct-to-consumer service and might have been canceling early. That's, that's my best guess. There might be other reasons, too. Um, so W got a ton of money from Peacock, upwards of $70 million, I think almost $80 million in the network revenue segment, whereas they usually do somewhere in the 40s, $40 million per quarter in that uh, in that segment. So WrestleMania on Peacock was a success. Yes. Whatever that means. Uh, no numbers, of course. Peacock has asked us not to disclose those numbers, Nick <laughs> But it was a huge success. Stephanie said that it was the most watched live event on Peacock's young history. Can you name another live event in Peacock's history? Uh, nope, nothing. <laughs> Maybe they've done uh, soccer or something. I have no idea. Uh, fa fast lane. <laughs> fast lane. <laughs> yes. More viewed than fast lane. We can say that with certainty. Um, <clears throat> the, the other thing that didn't really occur to me until the last day or two before the earnings call. Was that, you know, maybe we'll still be able to get uh, some indication about how popular and how well the W Network is doing because, you know, U.S. is gone. But W always used to break out the international subscribers. They would show here's, yeah. here's domestic subscribers, here's international. And uh, that would be included as a slide in the KPIs. That would be included in the quarterly report and other things. Um, but international subscribers, no trace of any reporting, even though, you know, there's still going to be, uh, there's still the direct consumer service. Uh, in, in a number of international markets, which you can get a VPN, I've heard. I've, I've not, I'm not talking around something here. I've not signed up for a VPN, but uh, you can, you know, they're still there. And uh, those subscribers are still direct to consumers. So they know those numbers, but they're not, they're apparently not going to uh, report them anymore because the biggest piece is gone, which was 70% was US. Was it Christina Salen or Nick Khan that mentioned something about doing similar Peacock type deals in international markets, which I don't know much about international streaming services, but I'm, I'm sure there's probably some in the UK, but I can't imagine all these countries having international like streaming services like that, that would be able to provide the money they're looking for. So what would you say? Let's think about the market. So the U S market is taken now. We've got the Peacock bought yes. up the rights in the U S. So what are the biggest other markets for biggest other countries for WWE? viewership popularity india probably india. Right? do they have india. a deal in india for the network do you know uh not that i know no. they do so okay. their, their tv partner in sony for ron smackdown is sony okay in, in india there's a streaming service called sony live 
that is taking care of the network and is offering at a lower price point because you know, the economy in, in India uh, is smaller, at least per capita than, than the economy in the United States. So people don't have as much money. So they've got a lower, more appropriate price point for that market there. Um, that is the number two. Okay. Let's call it the number two market. Definitely in terms of TV rights, it is. Number three market for WWE. Should I be playing the Jeopardy song right now? Uh, I am. Hmm, see, I'm torn between this, between England and, and, and China, believe it or not. Not sure. Ch- was I right with China? <laughs> no. no. No, I would not put China in the top okay. five, maybe not top ten. All right. Uh, so is it the UK? <laughs> it is the UK. Yeah. And there is no uh, rights holder to WNR content in the UK. It's just direct to consumer. So I don't know if there's an obvious partner for uh, WD Network uh, rights in the UK. I've heard, uh, so Sky, which was their former partner, yeah. now with BT Sport. Sky is owned by Comcast, which owns NBC Universal. But uh, I, I, I talked to somebody uh, the other day who's familiar with the UK market. And um, I, I suggested maybe Amazon, but uh, maybe Amazon's not uh, interested in anything but global rights. But I don't know. If you have any ideas, if any listeners have any ideas about what streaming platforms would be uh, a good fit for W Network rights, let me know. Um, after that, I think number four would be Canada. And the rights have been owned by Rogers since 2014 yeah. as part of the 10-year deal between Rogers and WWE, which included Raw and SmackDown rights. Um, and uh, I don't know what their biggest market would be after that. Maybe we get, get into... Uh, Germany or Australia or something like that. But uh, yeah, but Nick Khan did say he wants to do similar deals in, in other international markets. So that that's a, an area for possible growth. Um, <clears throat> I finally sat down and did the math, just compared the AAV, the average annual value of the UFC ESPN deal, uh, ESPN plus deal for their pay-per-views to WEs. And uh, the, the, now this was a deal that was done in 2018. The Peacock deal is a deal that was done in early 2021. So that they're more than, Three years apart, right? Is that right? I think right, 2019 and yeah. Yeah, just don't. I think there, there's is like May done around the same time as the Raw and SmackDown deals were done for WWE. But anyway, the ESPN Plus deal is $750 million over five years, an average annual value of $150 million for ESPN for their their pay per views that you're buying direct. You're dr- directly buying. You yes. have to be a subscriber of ESPN Plus, which is $5 yes. a month. 10, and then I think. Oh, no, it's five, but. If you have like the package of Hulu and all that, yeah, that's where it is for ninety nine. So, but most people buy it with a package, a bundle. So you have to hold that sub in order to make yeah. a a purchase. Is it sixty or seventy dollars now? For sixty. Yeah, I think it's fifty nine ninety nine. Yeah, which they just did one last night. Yep. Packed house, over ten thousand people in attendance. Jacksonville, no social distancing. Nope. Probably few masks. I think I heard, but anyway. I would have to do the math. I would think that that's going to generate more money for ESPN than Peacock paying $1 billion over five years, $200 million AAV. Or the UFC to ESPN Plus deal, $150 million AAV. That's interesting to me. Peacock is, what's their sub? $499 for the lower tier, $1099 or $999 for the, uh, the, the, the commercial free tier. So it's just a, an interesting comparison. Of, you know, I know ESPN Plus is a, a few years ahead of, of Peacock there. So they so Peacock, I guess, just had had to pay a bit more of a premium because they were a little, a little later to the game. Now, you actually have – we were talking about Amazon here, and you actually have a clip from uh, Nick Khan discussing Apple and Amazon, which should be interesting to get into. So uh, I think the biggest and maybe most interesting takeaway here is Nick Khan talking about Amazon and Apple. And we're going to play this clip. And you notice um, you know, NBC Universal gets talked a lot about a lot here because they're obviously dealing with the, uh, with Peacock and they're the, the rights holder for Raw. They're the rights holder for NXT. We'll talk a little bit more about NXT later. But uh, there's no discussion of Fox in this clip, I think, that we're about to play. So my, my read is that this is Nick Khan sort of signaling that you know, Apple and Amazon should or could be interested in the rights, I think specifically to SmackDown. I think it's most likely that Raw will stay with uh, NBC Universal because of there's because there's so much involvement between WWE and NBC Universal both in terms of Raw, NXT, reality programming. Uh, but uh, but SmackDown maybe is the property that they could negotiate and shop 
more aggressively. So the big moment where the FANG companies come out, FANG is an ac- acronym. Do you know what that stands for, Chris Gall? No, t- t- tell the audience. Facebook, it's, there's two A's, F-A-A-N-G. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and uh, we're leaving out Microsoft, but those are among the most valuable companies in the world in terms of market capital. And uh, the idea is that if those companies get involved in live sports bidding, that's going to increase the demand and the value of rights like Raw and SmackDown rights even more. So uh, here's a question from Brandon Ross answered by Nick Khan. Great. And then I guess you gave a little bit of your opinion on where the NHL rights might wind up. Talked about Amazon getting Thursday night earlier. Can you just broadly give us some color on what you're seeing out there in terms of other suitors in the digital universe besides Amazon's appetite for sports content? Are are there a bunch of players? Is there real interest outside of Amazon? We we, we think Apple TV is ready for something. Um, They've come close on a number of live events. They haven't decided to go all in yet. So we're looking to them uh, to see what their moves are going to be. Um, it's not just the digital companies. And I know your company yesterday, there was uh, an article about a conference you guys were at uh, where you said, hey, not you specifically, but one of your partners, hey, look at these yeah. big tech companies coming in. Um, those are the behemoths. We agree with you. To Disney's credit, to Comcast's credit, to the credit of others, they saw it. Maybe a moment in time late, but they saw it. So we think there are going to be significant competitors for different premium content rights for everybody. And what we know is live matters, and that's what we do. So there's Nick Khan. This was one of the installments of prognosticator Nick Khan here, uh, giving his, his thoughts about the, uh, the outlook on the media ecosystem. Um, but again, that, that's base, basically just goes to what I, what I said before. I think he's trying to set up, you know, hey, look. Fox, but you better uh, continue to give us a uh, great treatment and, and give us a great deal and give us, give us a reason to not uh, really go after Apple and Amazon. Amazon seems more likely. Uh, I don't know that Apple has any sports content at this moment, but who knows? Well, they, well, they don't have any, I mean, it'd be the, they, I, I would imagine Apple TV. I mean, obviously I don't have the numbers, but it's gotta be probably one of the lower of the major subscription networks as far as because it's it doesn't have a lot of buzz normally people don't really talk about it as much as they do netflix and hulu and amazon prime as well you know as well as peacock and paramount plus and all that yeah so like i mean they were probably looking for something to set them and, and but here's the interesting thing about apple too that you you mentioned last week on wrestlenomics that you don't know if it would be a possibility but one of these companies buying a network like in who knows if Apple buys a network or Amazon, but yeah, Nick Khan speculated with Colin Cowherd that Amazon would buy a major linear TV network, maybe like Viacom, CBS, or something, which might might, might make sense. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, other prognostications by Nick Khan here. Uh, he said that NBC and, and the NHL are done, and he said that Amazon is negotiating to get their their Thursday night football exclusive early. I think there's another year left of the NFL deal where they don't have exclusivity on, on Thursday, but in the new deal they will, but they maybe they want it earlier. A, uh, a former Fox sports executive, Pat Crakes, uh, he tweeted something to the effect of, I have it somewhere here, but that, uh, is, is he going to talk about the actual earnings or is he just going to, uh, muse, uh, his thoughts about, uh, the media business? <laughs> but if NBC and the NHL are really done, which, by the way, if people don't know, the NHL made a deal with ESPN for not all of their games, but the A package, what is being called the A package, by people who know more about the NHL sports rights than, than I do. And then the B package would still be available, but uh, Nick Khan reporting that that NBCU and, uh, and the NHL are not going to continue their deal. So moving NXT off of Wednesday, presumably to get out of the way of NHL uh, coming to Wednesday nights for their their uh, NHL games that are currently on NBC Sports Network is going to shut down at the end of the year. Uh, not the case, which would line up with something that uh, 
Nikon said in the previous earnings call where he said that uh, NBC Sports Network shutting down would not affect NXT or Raw. There's that. So why did they move? One of the talking points is that, well, they moved because being on Monday is almost, you know, being on Tuesday is almost like a lead in because you get that, lead, uh, you know, that, that audience from Raw that, I don't know, watches Raw and then continues watching USA Network 24 hours later. <laughs> or I, don't, I don't know how much I buy this idea that that a Monday to Tuesday is a lead in, even though they are on the same network. Do we have NXT on our run sheet? Uh, yes, we do. And we actually uh, have a uh, clip uh, from uh, Christina Salen on NXT. Yes, where she's being asked about uh, the media rights deal. So NXT's deal, current deal, first deal, first uh, two-year deal with NBC Universal expires in the fall. And they, in conjunction with the announcement that they're moving to Tuesday, announced that they had renewed a, a deal with NBC Universal for the NXT rights. Multi-year deal. No further details uh, in terms of the value or the specific number of years. But we've got uh, Stephen Cahill from Wells Fargo asking this question, and then we'll jump to the answer from uh, Christina Salen. Just curious how the AAV of, of NXT um, performed or, or was contracted, you know, based on what you had sort of baked into to the year for guidance. Um, so he's asking, he's trying to get an idea of, you know, did the uh, you, you've, you've given us average annual values of, of other deals sometimes in the past. I guess he's referring to the U.S. deals, which we know $205 million average annual value for SmackDown, $265 million average annual value for Raw. Is the new deal with NXT something we have to think about when we're trying to estimate the profitability or the other financial details of W's business? And uh, this is a multi-part question, so we'll jump ahead to Salen's answer here. Uh, with regard to NXT, yes, NXT um, was um, expected, um, obviously, because the contract was up and it is within our, uh, our guidance range that we provided. So there's no, um, there's, we're really pleased with, with, uh, with that result, um, but there's nothing to update with regard to guidance on that front. So the answer is no. Why is it so hard to get this number? Like, why are they protecting this number? Um, well, they have no obligation to disclose it. I guess. I think if it was a really good number, they would, they would leak it to someone in, in, the, in the media in the, in the media news world. This is just a speculation of me trying to, to play the game theory out. So the Hollywood Reporter in 2018 reported the, the average annual values, reported the financial details of, of the Raw and SmackDown deals with NBCU and Fox. And I think you want that out there so that other potential suitors you know, kind of know that you're, whoa, that's a big deal. And uh, yeah. that's what it costs. And you sort of drum up hype and interest in, in, the, in the value of your rights. You don't disclose that if it's a disappointing if it's a smaller number, number, yeah. if it's a mediocre number. So as we talked about in a recent episode, I think the value, and I still have to do a video or something about this showing, showing how I did this estimate. I think the value of NXT in the first term had an average annual value of around $20 million. That is the most plausible uh, set of, uh, of, of variables. It's where the math comes out to about $20 million, really maybe more. I got something like more like $18 million average annual value. And I could see the negotiations being something like, okay, you want an upgrade and they, they, you know, they'll be negotiating for an upgrade for NXT and uh, NBCU saying, well, the viewership could be better. How about we put you on Tuesday and, and you deliver better viewership because you won't be opposed by AEW that's taking a bite out of you. And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, we'll see how well it does at that point. And then maybe you can earn an upgrade that way. So, but maybe it, maybe they got some degree of an upgrade. Maybe they didn't, but I don't think this is a big financial deal for WB. And I think it's worth substantially less than the AEW deal, which is worth $44 million uh, per year on an average annual basis. All right. And I know we have another clip uh, from Christina Salen. It looks like it on, uh, she was on CNBC regarding DraftKings. Yes. Minutes before the earnings call happened. Christina Salen appeared on an NBC Universal Network, CNBC. <laughs> One of the more interesting things is, is she was asked about DraftKings, which is uh, W announced a, a deal, a partnership recently with DraftKings to do some sort of limited gaming. There's not not betting happening there yet, but but here's the interaction with Christina Salen and a CNBC anchor. So, Christina, also uh, seen announcements uh, of late uh, with with betting companies. Um, t talk us through that, and forgive me for for asking the follow-up question, which is how do you bet on uh, on a sport that's essentially staged and, and fixed? Yes. Well, we recently announced uh, in the first quarter as well 
uh, a partnership with DraftKings. We're very excited about it. And we, uh, we launched it with WrestleMania and, um, and, and, and you're right. Um, uh, in some, in, in our case, the, uh, the outcome is known, at least by us, but we're seeing uh, lots of opportunity in the future, uh, around events where the outcome is known by some folks. For example, the Oscars upcoming, there's betting around um, uh, the Oscars for the first time. So we think there's an opportunity to really engage our fans in an activity that they enjoy, which is betting, um, and and uh, circle it around our um, the other activity, which they really enjoy, which is watching the action in the ring. It's uh, that's a very uh, helpful comparison, actually, that with the Oscars, Christina. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. So I just, I just thought that was uh, amusing and sort of a, of a of a check in on what what very posh CNBC announcers think of the fake business of professional wrestling. Staged. <laughs> no, but I, I uh, you can bet on dancing with the stars, the mass singer, oh, like yeah. Like. I, and one of the real concerns is that you see. You see big swings sometimes because clearly smart money comes in from perhaps people within WWE who know the finishes and who are like, oh, they got the finish wrong. Boom. Load it up with with a with a really favorable bet and the odds swing big and suddenly. So moving on, uh, uh, Stephanie McMahon was uh, asked about WrestleMania business and she gave some details and uh, definitely has a different number than uh, what we saw from the Tampa Bay Sports Authority. But uh if you want to play that clip, we can kind of get into the WrestleMania number. Yeah, Stephanie McMahon called WrestleMania the power of belonging. But then she talked about the, some financial details, which we'll actually listen to here. Video views during WrestleMania week across digital and social platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, hit 1.1 billion. And 32 million hours of content were consumed, representing a 14% and 9% increase, respectively. WWE-related content saw 115 million engagements, and WrestleMania was also the world's most social program both nights of the weekend, delivering 71 Twitter trends. As Nick mentioned, for the first time, we launched a series of NFTs featuring The Undertaker. At record-breaking WrestleMania weekend e-commerce sales and record merchandise per capita sales in stadiums. Okay, so there's that. So the key things... To hear there is that she's saying uh, digital and social metrics were up up 14, up 19% year over year versus the WrestleMania of last year. So that's perhaps positive. New media, I think people are engaging with these things more in general. So I wish we had a baseline to, to measure that against. But that's at least not bad. And 71 went, uh, Twitter trends. But remember, Nick Khan said Twitter is such a small audience. <laughs> You you you, can't, you have to uh, endorse things when they suit you and dismiss them when they don't. Um, <clears throat> and then more on, on a on a financially meaningful point, e-commerce sales. It's just W shop and things of that nature. Uh, some sort of record not specified. And then merch sales in the stadium, the highest ever. Uh, I wonder how they're calculating that. If they're calculating every every paid ticket in the building, because obviously a lot of people went to both of these. Are you? Are you counting? Um, are you, yeah, there's a number of ways to do this, which are very complicated, which I will touch on here as we talk about the actual WrestleMania attendance, because figuring out the actual WrestleMania attendance is highly complicated. Um, so the Tampa Sports Authority responded to my request, and I know they responded to a number of other requests and distributed the, the same information. They they gave us audits, or are called ticket audits, I guess, which I, I are generated from from Ticketmaster, if the PDFs are any indication, because they say Ticketmaster at the top. So what we got here, um, let's just put the numbers out here first. WWE announced 25,675 people both nights, identical number, about 25,000 and a half both nights. So they could, over 50,000 attended, right? That's the announced attendance. So <clears throat> tickets distributed was about 22,000 each night. And I think tickets distributed include relocations. So we got something included in this disclosure from the Tampa Sports Authority that was a scan count. I read that to mean this is every time that somebody at, at, the, at the gate took their, their scanner and, went and scanned somebody's ticket, which is probably something you have to do when, when you move somebody's seat for whatever reason. 
Uh, I think a lot of times people's st- seats are moved, perhaps in, in this situation, just to get more people on on a on an area of the the venue where they're going to be seen by the camera, so the uh, venue looks more full. But anyway, there were some relocations. Um, there were some comps, which uh, comes to a, a paid attendance of for night one twenty thousand one hundred and seventy two, and for night two twenty thousand six hundred and thirty four. So over twenty thousand sold tickets each night. Um, which is complicated to figure out based on these audits because we had a number of different products that I had to sum. We have single day tickets for Saturday. We have single day tickets for Sunday. And then we have two day tickets for both Saturday and Sunday where people were allowed to buy the same seat for both days. Naturally, if you want to go to WrestleMania, you want to go to both days. Um, and then we had suites for Saturday and suites for Sunday. So there were basically five multi-page documents to deal with here. Anyway, the number of people who actually went into the stadium as spectators was well under 20,000. Uh, perhaps people bought tickets and just didn't show up because of COVID hes- hesitancy. Maybe people bought tickets and didn't show up because they were bought by secondary sellers who figured the event would sell out fast or there would be high demand and they would be able to sell them at a profit. Anyway, the number of people actually in the stadium on day one was about 18,000, 17,946. And the number of people actually in the stadium as spectators now, not ushers and hot dog sellers and and things of that nature, uh, people in the stadium to be spectators, 18,501 on day two. That drew, according to my article on WrestleMonics.com, and it is as I uh, $6.2 million in ticket revenue. That's a lower average ticket price then WrestleMania has been sold for in a number of years. So there, I, don't know, there, I don't know what exactly determines that. There were dynamic ticket price. There was dynamic ticket pricing on, on Ticketmaster. Yeah, I don't know. It maybe if the demand was stronger, they, there might have been changes in the ticket price that would have driven a higher average ticket price. But or maybe they just anticipated less demand because of COVID and the, the nature of the situation. No international tr- fans able to travel in. But anyway, uh, that is a lower average ticket price. I think it comes out to something like one hundred and fifty. Uh, I will spare you the online math. So $6.2 million in ticket revenue. Stephanie says that they set a record for venue merch. Um, what does that mean per capita? The, usually for a, an average event pre-COVID, WWE would do about $10, 11 maybe even $12 per capita. That means for every paid ticket, you sold about $10 in merch. So a record, would I would think, would be somewhere between $15 and $20 per head, which would come out to something like $750,000 maybe in venue merch. So you'd get up to maybe $7 million uh, in in merchandise and tickets. Now, I remember some idiot came on this podcast a few weeks ago just after WrestleMania and estimated $10 million in ticket sales for uh, WrestleMania. But uh, I, I figured the average ticket price would be much higher than what it was, so... All right, uh, and then uh, moving on to some more uh, Q1 uh, report stuff here. Uh, the Morgan Stanley and Needham price targets. They both, uh, I don't know if, if Needham was raising its target, but Morgan Stanley definitely was. Uh, Morgan Stanley tends to be, uh, I think they usually put out some pretty good estimates. I sometimes see the Laura Martin estimates though. Um, <clears throat> $65 is the price target. The idea there is this a price target, I think is meant to be, this is what we think the the price will be in a year from now. So $65, the stock price in aftermarket trading, I think responding to the how, how much it beat earnings by uh, was up 3% in aftermarket trading, but then was back down uh, about 3% uh, on the day. So, so down lower than it was before the earnings report, even though they beat on profitability. So I, I don't know what's, what's driving that in the, in the history of Russell Knox, we have never we have not often been able to figure out the the madness of W stock price, uh, at least the, the small movements. So, fifty four dollars. It's it's in that yeah. range. Well, 50, I can see it, I can see it. In fact, on the on the ticker right now, fifty four dollars and twenty five cents. Fifty four twenty. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Four billion dollar yeah. company. <laughs> Got it pulled up there on a on my Robinhood app. Um. So all right. So and then uh, some more things happen. Uh, uh, some personnel moves. Uh, with the WWE, first off, we had a, quite a few people that uh, were uh, let go of their positions. You know, looks like a lot of reshuffling of the deck, but this one 
might have been a different reason why it was, he was uh, let go. Mark Carano, uh, who uh, at one point was the senior director of talent relations, but I'm not sure what his, you want to say, demoted position was under Laurinaitis. But, yeah, what happened to him? Why is he not working there anymore? Well, so, uh, it looks like he better? he seems to be the just the, the 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 rumblings, the rumors. He seems to be the scapegoat for the trash bag incident with Mickey James. What, what trash bag incident? What are we talking about? Well, Mickey's uh, stuff that was left at the Thunderdome was put in a trash bag and and sent to her, and she posted her Twitter video about it, tagging Vince McMahon. Thanks for the WWE care package. And uh, what what shocked me was is that St- both Stephanie and Triple H, I I'm not sure if Vincent too, actually publicly no Stephanie and Triple H publicly posted on Twitter like this is embarrassing we are so sorry and that person has been let go. Um, no, but Mark Carano has been a, a, a important figure in talent relations for a number of years. You may have seen him on such series as Total Divas. Uh, no longer with the company. Uh, Others have left the company as well. Brian Flynn, who's uh, somebody who's uh, appeared at W, he's been an important enough person to appear at W Business Partner Summits, where they usually uh, in, in pre COVID times, they would have this huge presentation. They would talk about all their strategies and all these great things they've done and invite all their business partners to WrestleMania and, to, and the day before or one of the days before they would do this big production. And he's been one of the people who has appeared uh, on a W Business Partner Summit. Um, so he was a uh, chief marketing and communications officer. He also had something to do with with fan research too, which is the subject of his his uh, business partner uh, presentation. Uh, Mead Rust, who's also somebody who worked in uh, in uh, communications in media, yeah. communications, I think. Uh, Joe Villa, who's the manager of publicity and corporate communications, is, is also gone. He had been with the company for twenty two years. Mead Rust has, had only been with WWE for about two years. I knew a lot of wrestling journalists that said uh, Joe Villa was a guy that got him a lot of those connections and interviews and stuff like that. I saw some stuff. People people were pretty bummed out about that one. Uh, Nicole Zioli, who was the director of talent relations, she left the company. She had been with the company for 11 years. Uh, John Cohn was maybe moved out of his position, but reportedly reinstated, according to PW Insider. Uh, and Rudy Charles, a.k.a. Dan Engler, uh, still a referee, but uh, has been uh, has left his talent relations position. Those are the people who are leaving. And then this week we got a press release announcing that Nick Khan has hired three people. Uh, two of them, formerly from CAA, which is his former place of employment. Um, Chris Len, hmm, let's see here, Chris Legentil. I've read this name a number of times and now pronouncing it for the first time. Uh, he is the new senior vice president and head of global communication. So it sounds like he's replacing some of the, or he's, you know, heading up a regime that will replace some of the people who we just uh, mentioned who are leaving. Uh, he was PR on, on PR week's list of 40 people under 40 who are, you know, people to watch. He worked formerly at, uh, how do you say this company? D- Dazen? Dazen? Dazen. Dazen. He w- formerly worked at Dazen under John Skipper. who used to be in charge of ESPN and, uh, Let's see if I can say this other name. Scott Zing- Zaglini. Zag- uh, I would say it's Zaglini. Zaglini. Okay. Who is the new head of revenue strategy and development. He is formerly of CAA as a senior talent agent. And Alex Vargo is also being added, who is the vice president of revenue strategy and development, also formerly at CAA. So just a few of the people who have been added to the Nick Khan regime. I know there's other people uh, who are who are formerly at CAA who are, have already been with WWE. So, there all we right, go. there we go. You also had uh, an and on Verk here uh, listed. Oh yeah, move uh, is the actually new uh, as a broadcaster and the new voice of Monday Night Raw. I find this hiring very interesting just because he was let go. <laughs> from his last job leaking information to the media or at least not his last job, but when he was with ESPN and now comes to a business that tries to keep their information from that said media. Well, I, I, I think Adnan Verk's doing a great job. I'm really impressed with how he's doing so far on raw. You know, it's really great to see somebody with such awesome experience from a place like ESPN on there. And if he's listening, uh, you can, I, you know, I think he's doing awesome. <laughs> well, if he's listening, Thanks, Anna, but I'm just saying. 
I found it interesting that WWE would be the I mean type of company to hire him just from the previous path. Yes, but he he was a, a client of Nick Khan. Is is the moral of the story here? Have you have, have you watched The Sopranos? Uh, yes, yeah. So uh, there's a good quote from uh, I'm, I'm watching it now. I'm in, I'm in the uh, season six of there's like a six A and six B. I'm on six A among the final episodes here. And uh, but early on, there's a, a good quote from Junior Soprano. Corrado, which is his shoot name, he says uh, something to the effect of, "What's the the point of attaining success if you can't hire your friends?" You know, so that's that's one that sticks with me uh, in in relation to the professional wrestling business. Oh, well, you know, yeah, you network and you stay close, mm-hmm. and yeah, they, even if they don't, even if they aren't in the wrestling business, when they get in the wrestling mm-hmm. business, they still find their friends there. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Uh, I believe that will be it for any, this. Any thoughts on Triller? Did you watch the Triller pay per view? I did not. Um, I so I did not like. Well, I just saw the clips and all the stuff they did with the slap fight and the robot and Ric Flair like, was there. Yeah, Ric Flair was there. Um, I mean, them buying fights pretty impressive because Oscar they, De La Hoya was there. Yeah, and he, most, he somewhat he was there. Yes, he, he he may have not been fully uh, alert, <laughs> but it did major. For what we're hearing, it did major numbers. I mean, people like sideshows. I, like, I saw uh, one point five million pay per view buys, generating seventy five million dollars. That being done in twenty twenty one for boxing is really really impressive. It makes me feel like why couldn't wrestling? I think wrestling could do this if it was just better. It was just promoted better and you cultivated stars better. I'll fit it into my narrative. What, what have you got going on? Chris Gull? What do you got? Um, as I said last week, we've, we've uh, launched part two of uh, our XPW deep dive on rediscovering the Indies. You can get all the info on how to listen on uh, re- RTI pod on Twitter, rediscovering Indies on Instagram and uh, Facebook. But uh, yeah, no, uh, we we're, we're diving deep into uh, XPW. Like I said, we talked about Rob Black's, mayoral run uh, you know the the free fall with new jack and vic grimes the, them losing their america one tv deal uh you know we discuss uh you know a lot uh, including contracts of guys that you know and it like guys that were contracted wcw but did work and guys that were contracted wcw and waited it out and just lots of there's a lot of meat on the bone there and we're gonna have at least a third if not fourth part of this and it's going to get great when we start talking about the trial but also the uh, messiah incident and he was on america's most wanted <laughs> so uh talking about, about the thumbs there's there's thumbs involved right yes 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 we're gonna talk talk about the severed thumb i remember hearing about that in like internet relay chat and what, what is this 2000 yeah <laughs> yeah that lines up so but yeah, other than that, you could follow me on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Instagram at Chris Gullo. Uh, just did two past wrestling shows, uh, wrestling events, or seminars, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> just did two past uh, things, and uh, but right now I don't really have anything down the pike next couple of weeks. So, you know. And if you are, hey, if you have wrestling promotion and you're looking for a quality ring announcer, or broadcast, or a backstage interviewer, I'm your guy. He has a bow tie, and he will wear it. I have many colors and many suspenders in variety of colors, too. So that's all for this week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting WrestleNomics. You can go to WrestleNomics.com and read a lot of my written work. You can go to Patreon.com slash WrestleNomics and support and get access to the Master Spreadsheet and things of that nature. You can follow WrestleNomics on Twitter at WrestleNomics. You can follow me on Twitter at Brandon Thurston. I'm Brandon Thurston. He's Chris Cole. And we'll talk to everybody next time.